The following is a lecture given by His Holiness Jaya Pataka Swami on July 1st, 1984 in Atlanta, Georgia. The class begins with a reading from the Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Leela, Chapter 9, Verse 49 through 51. Jayo Sri Chaitanya Jayo Nityananda Jaya Daita Chandra Jaya Gora Bhakta Brinda Jaya Daita Chandra Jaya Gora Bhakta Brinda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Daita Chandra Jaya Gora Bhakta Brinda Jaya Daita Chandra Jaya Jayo Jayo Sri Chaitanya Jayo Nityananda Jayo Jayo Sri Chaitanya Jayo Nityananda Jaya Daita Chandra Jaya Gora Jaya Daita Chandra Jaya Gora Bhakta Brinda Mukhakaro Tiba Chalang Pangulangai Tegining Atki Pata Mahang Bande Sikarungi Nathari Nam Sri Chaitanya Charita Amrita Adi Lila Chapter 9 Mohammadak prema fala pete bhodi kai Mati lo sakala loka hashe na chegai Translation The fruit of love of Godhead distributed by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is such a great intoxicant that anyone who eats it filling his belly immediately becomes maddened by it and automatically he chants, dances, laughs and enjoys. E malakar kai e prema fal Keho gora gori jaya keho to hunkar Deki anandita hoya hase malakar E malakar kai e prema fal Nirabadi matto rohe nivasha vibhav Translation The great gardener Lord Chaitanya personally eats this fruit and as a result he constantly remains mad, as if helpless and bewildered. Translation, the great gardener, the great gardener. Lord, Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya, personally eats this fruit, personally eats this fruit. And, as result, and as a result, he constantly remains, constantly remains mad, as if helpless and bewildered. As if helpless and bewildered. Report. It is the mission of Chaitanya, of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to act himself and teach the people. He says, Apuni achari bhakti kori lo prachar. Chaitanya Chaitanya Rita Adi 441. One must first act himself and then teach. This is the function of a real teacher. Unless one is able to understand the philosophy that he speaks, it will not be effective. Therefore, one should not only understand the philosophy of the Chaitanya cult, but also implement it practically in one's life. While chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sometimes fainted and remained unconscious for many hours. He prays in his Shikshashtaka, Yuga itang nime shena chakshusha pravishayitam Sunyaitang jagat sarvam govinda virahename. Quote, O Govinda, feeling your separation, I am considering a moment to be like twelve years or more. Tears are flowing from my eyes like torrents of rain, and I am feeling all vacant in the world in your absence. End of translation. Shikshashtaka 7. This is the perfectional stage of chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and eating the fruit of love of Godhead as exhibited by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. One should not artificially imitate this stage, but if one is serious and sincerely follows 
the regulative principles and chant the Hare Krishna mantra, the time will come when these symptoms will appear. Tears will fill his eyes. He will be unable to chant distinctly the Maha Mantra and his heart will throb in ecstasy. See Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that one should not imitate this, but a devotee should long for the day to come when such symptoms of trance will automatically appear in his body. The great gardener, Lord Chaitanya, personally eats this fruit and as a result he constantly remains mad as if helpless and bewildered. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Lord Chaitanya, he showed practical Krishna consciousness by his own example. He would personally chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Why don't move this here? And he was frequently absorbed in so much ecstasy that that he actually fell unconscious. In fact. In chanting, he would chant so enthusiastically that sometimes in the middle of chanting he would become overwhelmed with ecstasy and just fall on the ground with a loud sound, thump. And his mother, Mother Sachi, if she was nearby the kirtan, she'd then become very much in anxiety because mothers are always concerned over their son's bodies. That uh, maybe he was hurt, of course, being in ecstasy and falling, somehow one is protected by Krishna. So, but because she was being upset, and it was Lord Chaitanya, Jai Nitai Gaur, Jagannath Subhadra Balarama Ki. The Lord Chaitanya blessed her that whenever he was chanting kirtan, she could also be in ecstasy, then she was impervious to what was going on. Actually, the real point about this is that by chanting Hare Krishna, one is able to achieve the symptoms of love for God very quickly. It's described that kind of like the way you feed a child at a feast, the sweet first, because they're too impatient to wait. Normally everyone will take first the soup, the salad, the main course, and then have the dessert at the end, but the kids want the dessert right away. So, in the Kali Yuga, because uh, people are not so much interested in spiritual life, Krishna has given the uh, dessert, the sweet, right in the beginning. You can experience the ecstasy very quickly. After having experienced the ecstasy of Krishna consciousness, then it's very easy to control the senses. Thus we pray to Lord Nityananda, Ha ha Prabhu Nityananda, Premananda Sukhi, Akana Doya Koro Ami Dukhi. To give us this mercy of experiencing transcendental love. Because even a drop of mercy from Lord Nityananda is enough to carry us completely out of this material world. And to the pure consciousness, pure Krishna consciousness. It's enough ecstasy that we can forget about all the material so-called happiness. Actually, these material bodies are machines. But due to an intricate arrangement of the false ego, or hankara, and the material body and the soul, the soul is identifying with the body. Although the body is actually a machine and is simply able to perceive through its senses due to a, an arrangement uh, by the material nature, Still, the illusion is so strong that we identify completely with this body.
So, in fact, even the so-called religious people of the world, if you ask them, they all admit they have a soul. In other words, their identity, they consider like the body, and the body has a soul. Rather than from the uh, Vedic point of view, like in just in, in just normal language, in Bengali, some will come up and say, "Tumar sariya kamonachi." That means, "How is your body?" Tumar means your, and sariya means body. Tumar sariya kamona. How is your body? You see, <laughs> and <clears throat> this is a complete different a perspective that you are a soul and you possess a body. You have a body. Not that you're the body and you possess a soul, and your soul is going to go to heaven, and you're, you know, and you're sitting in the grave, <laughs> or something like that. You are the soul. You're the spiritual entity. It's very scientific. The Vedic understanding has minutely described the size of the soul, the nature of the soul. It's part of God. It's a minute particle. It's indestructible. It's eternal, it's uh, by nature always happy, it's uh, by nature uh, full with knowledge, but that knowledge, that natural happiness has been covered up. So normally people will go through all of the various stages of spiritual development to have self-realization, God-realization, so on, and finally come to the level of Ananda Moya Bhyasat, actual ecstatic existence. But... In Kali Yuga, Lord Chaitanya is so kind, he's giving us the ecstasy, the ecstasy first, much in the beginning of our spiritual progress. As an impetus or as a special benediction, because people are very impatient and it's very hard for them to control their senses without experiencing some more immediate type of uh, spiritual reciprocation. So we should understand that the ecstasies that Lord Chaitanya is experiencing, his fainting or his crying or his laughing or the different eight symptoms of preliminary love for God and the symptoms of pure love for Godhead, that these symptoms are not material. What he's experiencing is not material. It's not like some uh, mother is crying because his son has gone off to the Navy or something like that and feeling separation. They're feeling the distance. It's, it's not the same emotion. It's a similar emotion. But there's a big difference in that uh, for Krishna, it doesn't simply stay on the mental emotional platform, but it goes right to the soul. And... When these ecstasies are being experienced, it's beyond the mind. At that time, the mind uh, doesn't know what's going on. And for those who have uh, scientifically analyzed the previous acharyas, have analyzed this uh, nature of ecstasy in Krishna consciousness, and at that time, the mind is able to perceive, the, the mind is very happy, the mind is ex experiencing, but what is the cause and what is the end, what is, the, you know, to try to label it or fit it in some category, the mind is incapable of uh, fully comprehending what is being experienced. At that time, the mind is just an observer on the side, goes beyond the mind. And that means it's completely satisfying to the self. So when the self is actually satisfied, at that time it's easy to control the mind. It's easy to control the intelligence. How to get the transcendental ecstasy of Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada has advised us that uh, we shouldn't try to imitate it. We shouldn't try to force it. It actually comes by placing ourselves in an intense situation of Krishna consciousness. Sometimes a devotee feels that there's too much service. But it's actually by accepting in a very intense, unbroken, continuous uh, period of service that that is like putting the iron in the fire. If you put it in the fire and you turn the bellows on and you fan it 
and you keep fanning it, then the fire gets hotter, hotter, and then the iron will start to get red hot. So it's like by having ourselves in an intense situation of continuous Krishna consciousness, then we start to burn up all the coverings on our consciousness. And at a certain point, then the actual ecstasy of Krishna consciousness we can experience when enough of the crust is burned off. Sometimes, just due to some very special association of an advanced devotee or some very... Prabhupada said that uh, when there's some very ecstatic kirtan, sometimes Narada Muni or some other liberated soul has visited the temple at that time, giving a special uh, boost to the kirtan chanters. You see, so Prabhupada advised that one should not artificially imitate this stage, but if one is serious and sincere, follows the regular principles and chants the Hare Krishna, the time will come when these symptoms will appear. Tears will fill his eyes, he'll be unable to chant distinctly the Maha Mantra, and his heart will throb in ecstasy. Uh, sometimes in chanting, uncontrollably, laughter will come. Again, this is not... Just like someone tells a joke and it's on a mental platform, it seems funny and you laugh. But this is an uncontrollable laughter. At that time the mind is kind of just standing there, it doesn't really know why the person is laughing. Because it's not laughing due to any change in the mind. He's laughing right from the spirit, right from the soul. In some kirtans, the devotees may experience this spontaneous laughter. It just comes out. At that time it's just like... Uh, a waterfall, water just going, just completely purifying one. Every chanting, every just even smiling is considered to be uh, very purifying. By clapping and chanting and dancing and smiling before the deities, this is the clapping, just like scaring away birds from a rice field. Once uh, so many material contaminations, they're just flying off one's consciousness. Actually, of course here, I don't think as many people have experience of scaring birds off of a rice field. Maybe off of a cornfield. <coughs> but uh, in uh, Mayapur, after 15 years we have plenty of experience, that when there's a rice, see, everyone grows rice at the same time, and it's just field after, like ocean of rice, and the wind blows, it's like a sea. And so all the rice normally comes at the same time to uh, to seed, to uh, its ripened state. So at that time, there are flocks of literally thousands and thousands of sparrows. I mean, millions. I mean, they can turn the sky black in, in a particular area. There's so many. And they come down. And they just hit it. Just, you know... They're just eating it rice as fast as they can. And so you have to have boys there with tin cans, a special thing. And then bam, 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 bam. They hit the tin cans with let off firecrackers and start screaming or clapping. And just by a sudden noise, and whoosh, they come out whoosh, whoosh, like a swarm of bees. And whoosh, they go off to the next guy's field. <laughs> so when it says by clapping your hands, how the birds come, it's not just like one or two birds. Whoosh, so many sinful reactions are leaving one. So many karmas are being freed. We don't know how purifying is the chanting. Of course, we do have a pretty good stock of uh, reactions from all the births we've taken in this material world. But still, those are not more powerful than the power of the holy name to purify Here in the West, this artificial imitation, we don't have too much symptom of. But in India, there are people who do imitate artificially to get some cheap attention. Or thinking that that's... Uh, when you do imitate, like uh, if you're an actor and you have to do a part... And Krishna Leela, sometimes even by imitating that particular part, you feel some bikar, some 
special feeling in the heart through imitating. So there are some people who they actually just imitate uh, some great devotees or this ecstasy. And in doing so, they do feel something. But because they're actually forcing it by their mind, it's, it's uh, very temporary. And it, uh, it's very detrimental because then instead of developing ecstasy on the developing one's uh, devotion and love for Krishna in a natural way, instead they, uh, they learn to dramatize their ecstasy. And uh, after it's over, how you can tell about those particular people is that the symptom is if after the chanting, if someone really feels ecstasy, they're, they're not going to have any desire to go up and light up a cigarette or, or to do something else like that. With these people that to put on the show, then afterwards you go and find that they're usually smoking or they're doing some nonsense activity. There are professional kirtan singers and they're very expert at imitating the ecstasies. There's a story about one guru at the time of uh, Bhakti Siddhanta or it was a Bhakti Vinod. He was so expert in crying that uh, he'd just shake and roll and cry and do a whole thing in public so much. They had two people wiping his eyes on both sides and... Uh, that uh, people were just amazed. They thought that, well, anybody that can do that much shaking and rolling, he must really be in ecstasy. But <clears throat> Bhakti Siddhanta would chastise him very strongly. That as a result of all this type of exploitation of the people, Bhakti Siddhanta or Prabhupada and the previous Acharya, they've always advised that even if one should feel ecstasy, especially if one's in a public place or if one's were there any non-devotees, and even in the presence of devotees, generally, one should try to contain it, allow it to be internalized. There are some times when uh, you can't, when it just uh, overwhelms, and that time, one is supposed to try to keep it down as much as possible. So as not to... Uh, because it just opens the door for people to imitate and then try to claim that they're really advanced devotees on the basis of some false standard. <clears throat> Text 52 Sarva loke mata koila apona saman preme mata loka bina nahide kiyan With his Sankirtan movement, the Lord made everyone mad like himself. We do not find anyone who was not intoxicated by the Sankirtan movement. And Lord Chaitanya made everyone ecstatic by the Sankirtan movement. This is not the same as like, I heard there's something here in the South, the Holy Rollers or something, where the people like they, they chant, get it worked up into a frenzy. I know that in uh, Iran, they have a sect called the Sufis. And they do have, I think, some branch in the States too. The Sufis, they madly dance and dance until they get like worked up like some kind of an African voodoo dance or something, where you can go into an actual trance by... Uh, it's not like that. This is something very sublime. The chanting and dancing, that automatically one feels happy, feels light, feels like dancing, and then it just gradually uh, increases without... Uh, it's not a forced thing. It's something that happens from within. Like a bubbling spring just coming out, one starts to just like feel very transcendentally effervescent, very happy, very ecstatic. J J Purbe Ninda Koilo Boli Matual Seho Fala Kaya Nache Boli Balo Bal. Translation Persons who had formally criticized Lord Chaitanya calling him a drunkard also ate the fruit and began to dance, saying, Very good, very good! Purport. When Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu started the Sankirtan movement, even he was unnecessarily criticized by Mayavadis, atheists and fools. Naturally, we are also criticized by such men. They will always remain and will always criticize anything that is actually good for human society. 
But the preachers of the Sankirtan movement should not be deterred by such criticism. Our method should be to convert such fools gradually by asking them to come and take prasadam and chant and dance with us. This should be our policy. Anyone who comes to join us, of course, must be sincere and serious regarding spiritual advancement in life. Then such a person, simply by joining us, chanting with us, dancing with us, and taking prasada with us, will gradually also come to say that this movement is very good. But one who joins with an ulterior purpose to get material benefit or personal gratification will never be able to grasp the philosophy of this movement. Hmm. I personally realize this last point. In India, we, because labor is relatively cheap, so, you know, the monthly wage is usually around $30 a month for skilled labor. Like, and for just the ordinary labor, it's maybe half that. And you can have a, like all the grihastas there, everyone says how difficult it is, but like all the grihastas, they all have a girl that takes care of their babies, that washes all the clothes, cleans the house, does all the work, but they have to pay 20 rupees a month. That's two dollars a month plus food. Here you probably get child laborers. <laughs> because they've got big families, they can't afford it. If you take a daughter and feed the daughter, clothe her, and pay her oh, 20 rupees a month, that's really, they're very happy with that. Because they have to feed the daughter, clothe her, take her, you know, they have to do everything and she doesn't earn a dime. So here she's completely maintained in a nice family, better than what they could feed her, and they're very happy. So, <clears throat> the grihasas, they're actually, they have much more time for doing their service. It's not actually a problem, but one thing we do, because the labor is cheap, we hire drivers for the cars, we hire gatekeepers and so many different people to free the devotees for works that only devotees can do. So what happens is you know, when they come, they always say, oh, I love your philosophy, I like devotion so much. And they're always, you know, very, very devoted. But not one of them, How, you know, I don't think one of them, maybe in so many years, ever became a devotee. Because they're coming out of some material motivation. It's very, very rare. If somebody comes as a devotee, they become their devotees. But when they come to get uh, this job or something, I've also seen people who have come simply to steal. In India, that's you got to be very expert in spying those people. And they also... They don't make an advancement. There was one devotee who used to visit all the temples, not only Iskand, but all the Vaishnav. He knew all the Vaishnav slokas. He knew the Bhagavad Gita. He studied it just so he could go to these different temples and pose himself as a very advanced person. He assumed a sannyas, called himself Sagar Maharaj. And, uh, you know, when we first came to India, we were a little bit raw. We didn't know all these things. So, I remember one time I was with him and we were coming back from the uh, from Mayapur and here in the, in the train station there was another Gaudiya Mutt that means another temple from another branch of Lord Chaitanya's tree and uh, from the same branch but a little bit separate. Suddenly this sannyasi jumped behind a taxi crouched down and, walked, and just shh. So what's going on? And later on we found that that was one of the other groups that he had stolen from. And so he had to do a whole, you know. So someone told us that this person is a thief. At that time, Madhavisa was there. I told him, don't give the person any money. He's a thief. Everyone, all the other temples have told us. He said, no, he's a sannyasi. He's very nice. How could he be a thief? He's chanting. In India, there are people that they only are do going just to steal. That's, uh, and there are people out here in America, Christians, just they haven't caught on yet in a, to the Hare Krishna. We don't have any money. But there are plenty of like evangelists, different people, that their own purpose is probably only to just get money. So in India, because that's the religion, so there are people like that that are going just to, to exploit. 
But our devotees are normally so sentimental. They treat the servant as if he was a devotee. And they spoil the servants. They spoil the paid people. They're not devotees unless they actually want to be... If they want to be spiritually advanced, and they work on a different level. They won't work just for money. And you get these people who are coming for some material reason. You have to deal with them as material people. Fairly, but strictly. Not as a devotee, not as a god brother guru bhai, but you know, in the beginning, no one understood these things. So he was treating this person like, oh, no, no, he's a pretty good person. And he gave him money, and he stole Prabhupada's typewriter, and he stole some money from the first Kumbh Mela, ran off with two, three thousand rupees. I tried to cut it off, hit it off at the pass as much as possible, but by the time I got to the Kumbh Mela, he had already uh, ran off with some things. Even we told them not, uh, Madhav Visa, not to give him any money, but they didn't believe us <laughs> until he learned firsthand. So like that, you learn a lot of uh, things, but actually one who joins with an ulterior purpose, you can see that they don't actually, they can't understand what's really happening. So even someone's negative, like we've heard that... Uh, Jesus apparently said, you be hot or you be cold, but if you're lukewarm, I spit you out. Hot water or cold water you can drink, or it's just completely tepid. It's uncomfortable, you don't like it. It's not nice. So if a person, even negative, says, I don't believe your movement, I don't, you know, just completely, even just, but not motivated. He's a, just a negative person. All right, I'll try it out just to see you, but you people are all wrong. Just from a negative aspect. But his actual interest is to become spiritually advanced if it was bona fide. That person, he can change his heart because he's sincerely negative. <laughs> he's sincere. Any sincere person chants Hare Krishna, takes Krishna prasadam, it will have effect because this is a bona fide process. And if a person is sincerely positive, Oh, well, it will work even faster. But if a person is insincere, that means a person is coming for some other motive. You see, that a person might be weak, that doesn't mean a person is insincere. But if a person is coming for another motive, just, uh, you know, like to come to steal or something like that, you don't really have uh, so much, I don't think of that here in the West. <coughs> So guards are pretty much down. But if there is such a person that's coming for some other motive, then uh, you find that they don't uh, understand the philosophy very well, even after a long time. So to make up for that, they have to imitate as if they're very devoted. That's why there's a saying in Bengali, Ati Bhakti Chure Lakkhan. Too much devotion is a sign of a thief. Too much bhakti. That means a person, normally if a person comes, he's going to have difficulties, he's going to have certain problems, he's going to have certain attachments, which are going to come up. It's expected, it's not expected that one comes and immediately is a superstar. That's very rare. But one will have to go through the certain, like pay the dues and go through uh, the preliminary purification until one comes up to the level of experiencing this ecstasy. And now if someone may be very fortunate to experience it right away. It doesn't mean it's not every person's an individual. But that's more rare. If a person comes and immediately is in everything is perfect, you have to watch out. How can somebody be so good? It's very rare. That's just kind of more Less from the Bhagavatam, more the practical realizations. The point that we should understand from this is that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, <coughs> even in India, even in India, he wasn't understood. The Mayavadis, the atheists, and the fools, they used to criticize him unnecessarily. Why? Because Everybody was chanting Hare Krishna, but they were doing it in a very mechanical way, in a ritualistic way. Only the priests, only the brahmanas. Lord Chaitanya came and said, no, this chanting is for everyone. And he showed in the Vedas that in the past it had been chanted by various types of people and that it's not restricted. But in the 
perverted caste system that had developed in India, it had become an exclusive thing just by birth. And Lord Chaitanya smashed that whole uh, illusion and reopened it up to the mass of people. And he inaugurated the congregational chanting. So at the initial stage, all these caste conscious people, they started thinking, what's going on here? You see, as much as maybe in the Roman Catholic Church, only the priest would chant the uh, Latin hymns when they used to do that. Not everybody would chant. So it was like that type of a people couldn't understand why everyone is chanting the Sanskrit uh, song. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Why people are chanting and dancing? You see, because uh, they didn't take the time to try to understand the philosophy behind it, to hear. It's not that there isn't a philosophy, there's a very deep philosophy and it's a completely bona fide. But they just didn't take the time to try to understand. So initially they would criticize. When they'd criticize, some devotee would hear and then uh, they'd preach to them. Somehow or another they'd convince them, well, you take some prasadam, you come and you try chanting. Why, why are you criticizing? And then in this way, if they were sincere and they would try it, then they would have the effect and they would themselves become uh, followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This happened so many times. So, of course, here we're finding uh, in the West that uh, the more impious the people are, the more their mayavadis or impersonalists, the more they don't want to accept God as the person and actually relate with God as an individual and thus be forced to surrender to God because the individual means that then he, as a person we have to understand that we are subordinate. If you just kind of keep him vague, something in the sky, if he doesn't relate with you. That's impersonalism. Then you can just kind of go on, do whatever you want. So, the more that that's prevalent, the less that people relate with uh, with God and his devotees as, as persons, and the more they just put them off in some kind of abstraction then the more that they are critical of the Krishna conscious movement. And they don't understand that why someone would sing and dance the names of God, why they're doing all these things. Relatively speaking, it seems that the Roman Catholics relate with God more as a person, just superficially, not absolute understanding. But in general, we find that in the Latin countries, the people, the Roman Catholics, do seem to take to Krishna consciousness relatively easily. Even in North America, they seem to be able to relate somewhat easier with our philosophy. Although we have plenty of Protestants and Jews who join. But in, in, to some extent, we've seen that uh, they're able to relate with it. Or at least, even if they don't become devotees in every case, they appreciate some of the things that we do, uh, general people, at least in South America, we find that the general people do appreciate uh, quite easily. Possibly it's because they may have more of a, a personal concept. But this impersonal concept was what Prabhupada had to deal with. That's why we say a prayer to him, it's mayavadi sunyavadi. Paschata Deshatarya, he's come to deliver the impersonalist and the voidist from the Western countries. So these Westerners, they actually have either think that God is zero, there's no God, or that if there is a God, that he's completely uh, impersonal and doesn't care, doesn't have anything to do with anything anyway. He's just some kind of abstract thing up there, up somewhere, down, whatever. They don't know who is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They don't have any factual knowledge. And <clears throat> to try to explain them is also quite difficult because they're already prejudiced. They don't want to, just like there was some person last night was saying his girlfriend didn't want to know God. She's quite satisfied with God being just kind of in a very awe awesome position far, far away. Don't want to have to deal with that. This is the basic kind of thing. People don't 
uh, actually give a place for God in their lives in, in a personal way because uh, they don't have that understanding. So to try to preach to them, there are very few people that can really relate with the philosophy on that level. If you check about self-realization, karma, yoga, they can relate with it. When you start talking about the personality of Godhead, many people start to become frightened. So for those people, better to get them to chant, better to get them to dance in ecstasy, get them to take some Krishna prasadam. And then automatically when they start to feel the, uh, this ecstasy, this love for Krishna in his preliminary stages, they feel so good, then uh, they become receptive to why is this happening. When you explain then about the personality of God, they understand it's not something to fear, it's not something strange, it's actually what we're missing in life. We're all looking for a friend. We're all wanting a friend. Our real friend is Krishna. Our real friend is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's with us in every life, and every circumstance. But we are turning our face away from him. So by Lord Chaitanya's mercy, we can experience what is association with Krishna. Because what is actually happening, we're chanting Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, the vibration Krishna, is not different than Krishna himself. Because on the absolute platform, the platform of God-realization, there's no duality. So the name of God, the person God, the form of God, the knowledge about God, the service to God, I haven't used the word God, but Supreme Personality of Godhead, is all one. It's all on the same transcendental platform. There's nothing material in connection with the Supreme Person. So as a result... The person who's doing this service, who's chanting, is getting direct association with Krishna. And that association is where the ecstasy comes. We're feeling ecstatic simply by associating with Krishna. Simply by His presence, by His nearness. We, our natural happiness is coming out. That happiness is love. Love for our most uh, dear loved one who we've forgotten, who we've been separated from so long, who we turned ourselves away from. And instead, we're misdirecting our affection. We're directing our affection to his immaterial energy, to dead matter. And that is the illusion. So naturally, if people can chant, take prasadam, get purified, and they start to feel the presence of Krishna, that is what's making them feel happy. And when they understand that, then their fear for Krishna goes away. And then they actually become more and more advanced as devotees. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Anyways, thank you, Tom. Any questions? Yes? For example, we don't actually see anything. According to the Vedas, say that in the material world, we are always in the past or the future. But in the spiritual world, you're in the uh, present. In the material world, you're in the past. You're thinking about the future, but you're actually already in the past because. Time is going so fast that as soon as it's there, you're already, it's already gone. In other words, just like science say that we don't see anything. Whatever we're seeing is a reflection of the light. So we're seeing something which is already a millionth of a second, whatever, gone. But in the spiritual world, it's more... It's in a more kind of a homogeneous atmosphere where you're actually 
not seeing your on the transcendental platform. It's, I mean, it's correct, inconceivable. Kind of, it's really inconceivable. You're not. You're you're realizing. It's not. There's a connection between everything. It's not that you're seeing the bouncing. You're just. It's not a mechanical thing. You're actually in touch with everything. Yet everything has its own individual reality. It's actually inconceivable by material <coughs> intelligence or. So in the relationship with Krishna, that is an actual eternal relationship. It's a soul-to-soul relationship. It's not based on, just like uh, as a body, we can relate with human beings. It's hard for us to relate with a fish. Or with, uh, with the, you know, they try to relate with dogs, but to what extent they're actually able to relate to can really communicate or have a, a, a meaningful, uh, you know, friendship is, is actually quite <coughs> limited because of the bodies. It takes two similar entities to be able to relate, but on the spiritual platform, the similarity is there. We're all eternal spirit soul, and relating on the spiritual platform, then we transcend the body differences. Maybe it's difficult for a Yankee to become a friend with uh, called Dixies or a rebel in the material uh, you know situation or difficult for a young person to relate to an old person or difficult for two diff- people from different cultures to relate with each other but in Krishna consciousness we find that people from all over the world from different backgrounds from different situations they're able to uh, have uh, immediately very intimate relationships on the spiritual is because it's not material by just like two things equal to the same thing or equal to each other so when you're related with Krishna then you're related with each other it's an automatic relation is established the Common, there has to be some common denominator. People talk with each other, they, they like the same thing. They like, in this way they develop a friendship on the basis of similar material attachments. Similar likes and dislikes. So they find themselves compatible. And this way they develop a material relationship. You see, some people, they're born in the same family, so because of a common interest, a common attachment to certain people, to certain environment so they they feel themselves uh, related with each other due to attachment but the devotees they're attached to krishna they're connected with krishna and therefore their connect their relationship is established due to a uh, relation with krishna now the relation with krishna is eternal and that's a spiritual relationship from soul to soul krishna doesn't have any material aspect of himself and his material aspect is his material world. But directly, he is completely spiritual. So, that relationship with Krishna is spiritual. And the devotees relating on that level of devotional service, they immediately also have a very intimate relationship. Because the relation with Krishna is eternal, the relationship between devotees is eternal, the relationship between the spiritual master and the disciple is permanent. Prabhupada was one time giving a class and then he said that I, materially speaking you're all young people from a different country and I'm an old man. Normally there wouldn't be such a deep relationship between us. There wouldn't be this type of it. But yet we find that there's such a very deep relationship. This is because it's on the spiritual part. Nothing to do with the material situation. Just like you show the materialist the back to guy, they see Prabhupada's picture, sometimes, why is he so angry? They can't relate with his grave countenance, his grave look. But then you, the boy looks, and he's very ecstatic. He's smiling. But he's smiling, you know, gravely. <laughs> they can immediately relate to that type of look, but the ordinary materialist, they look and they had a completely different idea from it. When I used to just read back to God, I remember that couldn't relate at first many people 
So the devotees, because they're able to taste even a drop, not even that they have to taste the whole ocean of ecstasy, but even a drop of spiritual happiness, they immediately feel intimate, some connection with Krishna. And this connection is there between the devotees and between the spiritual master and the disciple. And it's not dependent upon their material... <coughs> Just like their devotees in the movement. Some people are movie stars. And some people were farmers. Yet together they can serve and uh, they're quite compatible. But materially they would never <laughs> associate with each other. They would be complete uh, misfits. But on the spiritual platform there's no problem. Because the common denominator is there serving Krishna. 